if you if you go any if you go any longer, I get terribly aroused. <laughs> too, too bad. <laughs> I think I'll pay each and every one of you for that wonderful ovation as soon as I get my rig and refund. <laughs> By the way, the way, this is Studio One. This is for Johnny Carson fans only. Violators will be towed away. <laughs> What? This is, this is going to be a funny monologue tonight. <laughs> Look, if the Cubs can win a game, anything can happen. Right? Well, it's Larry Lavender. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bandbox. <laughs> you are just a vision. I welcome you to NBC. Have you seen NBC's new slogan? Yeah, our pride is showing. Yeah. Networks come up each uh, year with a new slogan. Our, I'll tell you, it's better than the original slogan they were going to use for the new fall season. NBC, watch us, we're desperate. <laughs> Too much begging, huh? <laughs> good Friday, we always get audience, good Friday night audiences. Must be because it's Friday, I guess. Yeah. And we are in Burbank. <laughs> I've done so many put-down jokes about Burbank, I feel guilty. So I should say something nice about Burbank. Is Burbank is a nice city. And there are quite a few so... No, 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 no joke. Do you know a lot of celebrities live uh, here in Burbank? Like, for example, doc Dr. Leopold F Fleckner. <laughs> Dr. Fechner, Fechner it is. Leopold <laughs> Fechner. He is the inventor of the Fechner Maneuver. And that is when you see a woman choking, you go up behind her. Put your hands on her waist, and you nuzzle the back of her neck. <laughs> it doesn't improve her breathing, but it gets yours going pretty good. <laughs> and as I often point out, there are a lot of sights to see for you people from out of town right out here in the valley. Uh, have you been to the drive-in shirts they have here? <laughs> Jack in the pew. You drive up and you shout your sins into a plastic priest's face. <laughs> Weird. I think they also have an express drive-in for six sins or less, don't they? You can just... <laughs> so weird item. How many of you go to fast food places? Now, I'm not going to mention any names at all. How many of you go to, you know, just okay. According to the news uh, in last night's and this morning's paper, it seems that Australian horse meat was sold to a food processor that makes up hamburgers for some of the fast food chains. Uh, I can't mention any names. Uh, well, <laughs> it may be true. I ate at one of those places today, a little fast food chain yep. here in Burbank, and I don't know where they got their meat, but I ordered a hamburger. And the patty ate the lettuce. <laughs> well, that, uh, you've got to be careful. There's... You really got to be careful in some of those fast food places. The place over in Alameda, I do not trust. Their special was Trigger McNuggets. <laughs> I mean, that's a... There's going to be some truth into it, because after eating one of those, you get a strange uh, urge to put on a fedora and pull an ice wagon. <laughs> Three. <laughs> well, let's do an update on the uh, Mediterranean fruit fly situation, because it, it's kind of serious. They found another dead fruit fly today was discovered in the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, no foul play is suspected. <laughs> uh, they did find a can of Raid nearby with a note saying he was despondent over the death of three million of his relatives. <laughs> you see, killing all the fruit flies isn't the tough part. The tough part is being the cop who has to draw that chalk line around the teeny little bodies. <laughs> that is a tough job. Now, that fly was dead, but they found three fertile three fertile fruit flies um, up in the, around Modesto. And that becomes a problem. Now, 
It doesn't sound like many, but three more, that's, yeah. that's because they, they get it made. What a life they lead. All they do is just mate. And uh, I guess that's it. Your tangerine or mine. <laughs> Nectarine? Well, let's see what happened. I guess the president is still up at his ranch. Of course he's up there, I know that. Why am I saying I don't know where he is? He's been up there for about four days. Yesterday, as you know, he signed the, uh, his new budget and the tax cut into law. And I think he has been out here a little too long in Hollywood because he signed it, best wishes, Ronald Reagan. <laughs> It didn't come from the heart, obviously. <laughs> they are, the controller strike is still on. They are desperate out at uh, Los Angeles, LAX airport. They have how desperate are they? I'll tell you how desperate they are. <laughs> they replaced some of the controls with Beverly Hills parking lot attendants. <laughs> yeah, when a, when a pilot lands now, a guy comes up with a window and says, that'll be $3, just park it against the wall. <laughs> yeah. Anybody here from Utah? <coughs> oh, okay. Your state is a little bit upset, right? Yesterday, apparently, the Department of Defense airlifted out to Utah something like 22,500 pounds of lethal nerve gas, the biggest airlift of lethal weapons ever. I guess they're going to store it somewhere in Utah, right? No state wants it at all, because they say two drops of it can kill you. Two drops. Now, you see, they could store it here in Los Angeles, because the smog would neutralize it. <laughs> Nerve gas jokes I didn't think would be too big. <laughs> Let's see. Jerry Brown was in the news again today in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they said Governor Jerry Brown is trying to shed what a lot of people have called his flaky image. For instance, Jerry says he no longer plans to wear the boxer shorts with the sayings of the Reverend Moon on them. <laughs> and he'll quit referring to Linda Ronstadt as the first squeeze. Anyway, tonight, we have... How many of you have seen the movie Tarzan the Ape Man? Right, okay. Tonight, the Mighty Carson Art Players will present our version of Tarzan the Ape Man. With Miss Betty White. Starring in the role of Jane, of course, will be Miss Betty White, and starring in the role of... And, of course, starring as Tarzan. <laughs> and, <playing. laughs> and starring as the Jungle Flasher. <laughs> also, two wonderful actors are here. Mr. Peter Strauss and Mr. Victor Bono are with us, so stay where you are. Our Tarzan sketch tonight is set a little later. Tarzan and Jane have been in the jungle. A long no, time. No, no, not a long, long time, but they've been there, and it's not, things are not as good as they were. Uh, my first guest tonight, you all know, he won an Emmy for a wonderful performance in a television show called Jericho Mile, and he received his third nomination for Best Actor in a Special for his work in Masada. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here. Would you welcome Mr. Peter Strauss? <laughs> I hear you just got back from Italy, and about a month ago, I came back. Yes. I'd never been to Italy before. You have obviously had, because somebody told me you, you speak Italian. I speak Italian. That's nice. But I'm surprised you came back. I wasn't going to. It's a nice country, isn't it? It is beautiful. You it get very scary. mellow there, and um, life is a little slower pace, and uh, things are not all that important. And I had, I had gone basically to be in Rome and Milan, and right. I... Uh, decided to take a car, which I'd never done from Rome, and drive to Milan instead. Took and your life in your hands. <clears throat> no, it wasn't bad. You go yeah. up through the mountains and... Uh, 
you, you, you draw very carefully. Right. Yes, you must. And I went to Florence for the first time. Yeah. I and did. I planned to have lunch there. And I parked the car and I stayed for four days. I <laughs> could not leave that city. Long city. lunch, huh? Oh, it is the I, most beautiful city. No, I didn't go to Florence this You didn't time. go to Florence? No, I'll make that next oh, year. You can't... It's beautiful. I find if you go from city to city and try to get too much in, I would rather spend a little time in one place for a while than go back the next trip and... Yeah. So how long did you stay in Italy? I was in Italy for almost two weeks. Did you learn any language? No, I try. I used to do that when I'd go to France. I would take out the, the French dictionary and you start. And you get over it and you find out everywhere you go they speak English. Of course. And especially the French. Um, the French are not as quite as gentle and, and helpful as the Italians. No. If you mispronounce something in a French restaurant, you will get a stare. You, you just sink lower and lower. Yeah. Well, the opposite yeah. happens where you work so hard to impress them with your knowledge of French. You have worked for hours and spent $3,000 at Berlitz learning how to order in French, and you do it in the most impeccable French, and the waiter looks at you and says, you want fries on the side? Or yeah. The guy yeah. is the ultimate put-down. I couldn't even make an effort to speak back to you in French. They have to let you know that they know you don't speak French. I went to a place... Uh, Outside of the East Coast, Juan Lapin, it's a little, little village, and um, there was a fellow in a restaurant who was very surly, and I'd heard him giving tourists trouble before, and we sat down, and he absolutely would not admit that he could speak any English whatsoever. And I would say, vous ne parlez uh, français, none, how do you say no. none? <laughs> he says, no, je ne parle français, no anglais, no, je ne parle. Finally, I said something in English, had had to do with a duck. <laughs> After I was sure he could speak no English, I suggested he try this act with a duck. <laughs> and he understood that. All of a sudden, hey, me with a duck. No, you duck, are you, you crazy? Maybe a chicken. How about a duck? <laughs> but they drive you. But in Italy, they're so helpful. Yeah, they're wonderful. They really are. And you eat so well there. I mean, the worse the place looks, the better the food. It is, yeah. it is in France, I eat a lot of three-star, four-star. And uh, the food looks so beautiful, the Nouvelle Cuisine. It's, it, uh -huh. The plates are artwork. The, they take um, string beans and they cut them very fine into almost ropes and they make baskets out of them and things. But, yeah. And it's, it's, you know, they present the food to you and you have three little things on the plate for $850. <laughs> I cannot take 62 sauces no. in one evening, and the mixture of things is, is, is staggering, and uh, the elegance of it gets to a point, you just want to sit there, have a hamburger, and go home, and... Yeah, I'm a little too provincial for most of that French yeah. cooking, and that's why the Italians bring out the yeah. pasta, and you that's go it. at it, and... And you sit so long in Italy. There's a saying in Italian, which I... Uh, in English, is when you sit at a table in Italy, you never grow old. Which explains why people in Italy sit for lunch from how would you two say that? to seven. How would you say that in Italian? Could you? Is there uh, a literal interpretation? No, for that? I don't know how you would. Uh, there's a. F uh, f let's see. It's quando a tablo. Uh, I don't know. I don't yeah. know because it's slang, and I don't know. Yeah. The slang. Some idioms are not no, translated at all. Translate yeah. at all. But it's beautiful there. I never realized how beautiful that city. Well, you must go to Florence. All right. It is. The colors are magnificent. And the artwork. The city itself is art. It, it's. I mean, did you go to Versailles in France? Yes. Yes. Have you ever been there in the fall? No. Because really, the colors are extraordinary. One gets an understanding of Impressionist yeah. painters because of that color that exists nowhere else in the world. And you go to Florence and you understand where art comes. Every place is a museum. Every building itself is a museum. I found Italy mainly was steps. Yes, you walk. <laughs> yes. They love steps in Italy. Statues and steps. You know, if you, if you want to go in the living room, where's the living room? Go up those steps, steps. over there. <laughs> go down the steps. Everywhere you go, yeah. steps in, steps out. Steps. Somebody said you had trouble in Spain, though. Oh, oh, well, what? I, I hadn't been there since okay, Rich Man, Poor Spain, Man, yeah. And, yeah. And, and Rich Man, Poor Man was very successful in Spain, and it was sort of a cult program, and I assumed I could just walk off the plane. Did you watch it in Spanish? Did you just... No, I didn't see it there, but uh, I, I, after two days, the, I had gone there to open Jericho Miles, a feature. I had to have two security guards. You did not know that Rich Man, Poor Man had been... No, I didn't man. know it was that staggering a success, and it was very funny, and... Um, I dated furiously in Spain. The women are beautiful. Yes. And they get, they, in, they, the women are interviewed in the mornings. I mean, well, no, they're interviewed during the day. I must clarify. <laughs> they, no, they are just interviewed sure. at some point. And, uh -huh. and you are written about on, in very important political papers. 
and there is no privacy. The journalism in Spain is is half very serious politics, but half right. extraordinary gossip. Right. And the two work together eventually. In other words, women who would go out with you, yes, would the be... papers would get to them for an interview. Yeah, and it was just. Did it did it help at all? <laughs> <laughs> I, only only when I got to write the story. <laughs> But they have a thing in Italy, in Spain, that's, in uh, Madrid, they have mansions. Have you ever been to those? In, no. They're old caverns down in the old part of town. Each one specializes in one particular hors d'oeuvre. And they're like little caverns. And you start at 4 o'clock, it's cocktail hour. And one will specialize in mushrooms with oil and garlic. And one specializes in, in sardines. And one is cheese. And you go from place to place to place. Mm -hmm. And each one serves the rawest, freshest wine. They, I mean, the, the, they, it arrives in pails. They haven't even bottled it yet. <laughs> the leaves and the twigs are still in it. And by 7 o'clock, you cannot walk out of that place. It is wonderful. It's, no, it's Spain, like a, I have not been to. Oh, it's beautiful. Spain also is great. I, I stay a month and a half. I, I found Europe fascinating and beautiful and full of life. And uh, Yeah, sounds like a great trip. Let me take a break. We'll do this first one of our sponsors, and then we're going to come right back here and have something to eat. Somebody said, no, when you were in Paris, you, um, you, as we say in the business, freebied your way through Paris. How did you manage to do that? I, oh, well, that, that also was on the, on the basis of the film. I was put for a week oh. in the Georges Cinq Hotel, mm -hmm. which I could never go to by myself. And right. I sent three shirts there to the laundry. I could have bought the shirts four times here. It's astonishing in a hotel in Europe. <laughs> yes. But, I mean, extraordinary service. And it was one of the most beautiful hotels in the world. Right. Um, I loved it. But if you go down to the country in Aix-en-Provence and you go down the south and stay in little pensions, it's beautiful. But when you can go yeah. first class and you do not pay for it, it is wonderful. <laughs> it's always the way to go. Wonderful Somebody else is picking up the tab. Oh, room service. You can actually order a $30 breakfast there. And it's orange juice, two croissants. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. For 30 And you don't feel bad. But when you go to, I mean, it is, it is staggering. I mean, four shirts were uh, $30 to clean and press. I'm serious. What? $30 to clean and, to, wow. and press. That's a little steep. Yeah. It is yeah, steep. That's... But they, they, you get them in an hour. They're still warm when they come. They do them while you're wearing them? I guess <laughs> might as well. You know. I mean, try getting shirt, four shirts in an hour in New York hey, in a hotel. Speaking of New York, you went to New York on your way back, and all yeah. of a sudden you got involved in a... In a, in a play you're going to do. Yeah, I'm going to Broadway. How'd that come about? Was I just, I, when I came back from Europe, I really felt sort of renewed. I just decided to take on a new challenge. And I, I walked around Broadway and realized that it had always been a dream, and that's where an actor is tested, and right. it was time to do something different. And uh, I wanted to get away from television for a while, and I... I so have you ever played the Broadway theater? Before? I've never done Broadway. Right. And I, I went, and I stood there, and I looked, and uh, I, at that time, a writer and producer that had a new play called Einstein and the Polar Bear, uh, they were looking for an actor. And the coincidence of timing was such that the day I called, my agent and said, I want to do a play, was the day they called and said, is Peter available for a play? All good actors, and you are a fine actor. Thank like you. to get back to the theater. You know, George C. Scott that goes back ever so often, and many good actors, because theater is not highly paid, no. whether you know this or not, it's, it's like television or motion pictures, but they go back there because that's the craft and they like to get up and exercise their craft in front of a live audience. It's, it's, it's the test. It is the place where... Is that the name of the play? Einstein, Einstein and, the and the Polar, polar Bear? bear. And it has very little to do with Einstein and less to do with a polar bear. It is, it is the story of, it is a very uh, emotional play about a reclusive writer whose wife has committed suicide. He's written two very important books and right. he retreats and becomes a recluse in New England and he communicates with only a few neighbors and one day a woman enters his life. Her car is broken down during a snowstorm and the relationship that happens right. between the two of them and the ensuing... Yeah. When do you do that, this fall? I start rehearsals in September, and we open on Broadway uh, at the Court Theater uh, October 21st. Now, you know what'll happen, what often happens. I've seen it happen. People go there, all of a sudden, the thing's a hit. Let's just say it's a hit. And all of a sudden, they say, we'd like you for a year or two. Well, I think most actors, you have to start with a six-month contract, which right. is a long time, but I, I know, I, and I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm staying here. I mean, I'm in the process of trying to find a house here. Are you going to do that, by I, th I think so. If I can get through this whole system of searching for one, the other day I had the honor and distinction of looking at a $1,160,000 fixer-upper. <laughs> 
Now, that sounds like he's putting you on, but only I'm, in California, I think, you know, and maybe back in Washington, D.C., would they say, uh, they don't even say million anymore. No. They, do, they just say, it's one, two. Great buy if you're handy with tools. <laughs> For one, two? Ocean view. Where Ocean you, view. You put your head through that little bathroom window, and, <laughs> and a mile down, you see two Japanese freighters unloading tuna fish. <laughs> That's right. And you just and part those bushes there and stand on this orange crate. You'll see an ocean nothing. view. Unbelievable. Uh, right, we're going to take a break here, and then high drama will ensue right here on this stage, folks. <laughs> One of the most publicized movies of the summer season is Tarzan the Ape Man. Now, this film, like the earlier Tarzan pictures, depicts only the very early relationship between Tarzan and Jane. We wondered what a movie might be like about Tarzan and Jane after they've been together for a number of years. fix the ladder. He's late coming home from work. I'll bet that jungle jerk's out swinging with the boys again. Again. Not Tarzan's fault. Vine controller strike. <laughs> Tarzan almost had mid-air collision with orangutan. Man, it's a jungle out there. This place is a mess. You haven't done any of your chores. Little chores, woman's work. Tarzan only have one chore. What's that? Empty hippopotamus litter box. <laughs> a provider. Will you look at this dump? Tarzan, good provider. Tarzan, get job. You're completely primitive. You're totally unskilled. You, you have the manners of a baboon and the IQ of an ape. Where could you possibly get a job? Tarzan already been accepted at post office. <laughs> As supervisor. to make anything of yourself when you sit around all day playing with a chimpanzee. It worked for President Reagan. <laughs> Where Tarzan's dinner? I don't have your dinner, banana brain. I'm a person in my own right. I have better things to do. Send out for some pizza. What their number? I don't know. Call information. There's some leftover rhino stew in that pot. Leftover rhino stew again. Tarzan think this is a little too horny. Tarzan, you're a slob. Hard to keep food down. Your cooking tastes like zebra puddle. Clean out all this foliage. What is all this stuff anyway? Which doctor helped Tarzan grow this? It called the Say This Some Plant. Say This Some Plant? Say This Some Bad Weed. <laughs> uh. Tarzan smoked no vine before its time. <laughs> the 
most insensitive man I have ever met. Of course, Tarzan insensitive. Tarzan raised by apes. What do you expect, Rod McEwen? <laughs> Quit feeling sorry for yourself, pygmy pants. You know the worst part of being raised by apes? What? Breastfeeding. <laughs> Me Tarzan, king of jungle. <laughs> Big king you are. <laughs> That wasn't exactly a royal performance you gave last night, King. That never happened to Tarzan before. <laughs> Are you kidding? Even at your best with you, it's strictly wham, bam, thank you, Buana. <laughs> Let's face it, you're not much of a man. Oh, yeah, quicksand chest. Tarzan, all, all man. Then how come when you take a shower under the waterfall, the hyenas all stand around and laugh at you? Hyenas always laugh. Yes, but they don't usually point. Don't talk about Tarzan's body. Him seen better jugs on top of Native's head. accomplished today. Tarzan go on hunt today with native warriors, Watusi, Maasai. You bangy? You betcha. Oh, Tarzan! <laughs> That's the trouble with you. You come on too fast and too crude. Tarzan may be crude, but at least faithful. Not like Jane. What do you mean? Tarzan know about night you made whoopee with Marlon Perkins. <laughs> Big deal. Just that one time while Jim worked his way down the river. Yeah. One time my loincloth. Around jungle, you known as Easy Country Safari. You're no angel. I found this under your mat. Yeah. Oh. An inflatable crocodile. That Tarzan's niece from Milwaukee. She's just your type. At least she's got her own teeth. That's the last straw. Tarzan, I have an announcement I want to make to the entire family. Boy, cheetah, boy. never felt at home in jungle. It just isn't going to work. I am a modern woman, but you are a macho, chauvinist, hopeless case. I'm leaving you and getting a divorce. Woman, stay with man. That law of jungle. You may have a law of jungle. I have a lawyer of the jungle. I uh, don't know what Jane talk of. You gotta be kidding. I'm taking the tree house and boy. And you can have that stupid-looking monkey you spend so much time with. <laughs> See you in court, shrimp vine. Yeah. <laughs> and all I get is cheetah. Tarzan may be dumb, but he not that dumb. <laughs> Tarzan will learn this next take from Benny Hill. We go spend several days in bush together. and join us for a few minutes later. She's so fun to work with. It's a great talent. My next guest is a very talented gentleman. He's a fine actor, also a poet. Would you welcome, please, Victor Bueno. Thank you. I managed to complete my education without learning anything about 
arithmetic. And at the time, my teachers warned me that someday I would pay for my profound symmetrical ignorance. And it's true, because I had to pay 60 bucks for a computer in order to write this, which is called, That'll Be the Day. On the day when I dip under 300 pounds, the Rockies will show up in Spain. <laughs> On the day when I slip under 300 pounds, Mr. Watt will propose something sane. When I'm 2.99 and the French forswear wine and one of Pete Rose's checks bounces and donkeys don't bray, then you'll know that I weigh less than 4,800 ounces. When President Agnew appoints Rona Barrett the permanent chief of the FBI, Brother Billy won't mumble, Cosell will be humble, and Cronkite's exposed as a Swedish spy. When George Burns is no longer funny and a ruptured appendix is fun and chickens date ferrets, I'll weigh less than six 680,385 carats are 15% of a short ton. <laughs> On the day when I need less than two yards of belt, Howard Johnson will stop frying clams. I'll be down to the bone less than 21 and 3 seventh stone or 76,800 drams or 2,100,000 grains, 86,400 scruples, 87,500 penny weight, or 136,077.6 grams. When I do it, you'll know it, the headlines will show it, but don't hold your breath, because it may not be soon, for the day when I weigh less than 300 pounds is the day I get weighed on the moon. <laughs> this is uh, called, that'll be the other day. On the day when I can diet in Vienna, or ignore a pot of bubbly Boston beans, or deplore a plate of pasta in Siena, or a plate of anything in New Orleans, when I toss away a suckling or its apple, or refuse a golden pheasant under glass, when I spurn a spot of Pennsylvania scrapple, and the very thought of tacos gives me gas, when you see I've lost my lust for ample dining, run outside, and if it's clear, you'll be in luck because you'll soon see Queen Elizabeth reclining in the nude upon a great big mallard duck. <laughs> when my locks and bagel mania stops drooping and my malnutritiophobia is no more, Mrs. Olson will drink tea and give up snooping while Bella Abzug models for Dior. <laughs> when spoon bread fails to make me feel religious, when I fail to pray three times a day while facing San Francisco, when I find the thought of English breakfasts hideous, the Ayatollah will sing punk rock in a Tijuana disco. <laughs> On the day when Peking duck cannot delight me, I shall snub some ice-cold milk and carrot cake to conclude the only food that won't delight me is the food that they'll be serving at my wake. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's difficult for you to see one such as I and think that I could possibly ever want for anything. I find it hard myself to believe it, <laughs> but it's true. Now, some people seek after power. Power is pleasant, that's true. Others seek wealth or exuberant health, and these things are very nice, too. But worldly power and glory are not what I pray to possess. Others may yearn for money to burn, but I require much less. I want to stroll up to a tailor and say with a radiant grin, this suit, as you see, is too roomy for me, and I'd like you to please take it in. <laughs> Taken the jacket and taken the vest. The seat is too loose for my taste. And there's no need to mention the pants need attention, so be sure to take in the waist. And often when I get away from the world and all of its sights and its sounds, I long for the day when my doctor shall say, you've got to gain 25 pounds. <laughs> I want you to eat at least four times each day. Don't object. You can do it somehow. I know it's a chore, but you've done it before. Here's a cheesecake. Get started right now. <laughs> and I long 
for my brothers to call and say, Vic, help us out, won't you please? We're going away for a holiday. Can we borrow your surfboard and skis? Or I'll tell my agent, please inform Miss Garbo that I'm flattered and I'd love to do her show and say yes to Fred Astaire. We'll make quite a graceful pair. But about that Playgirl centerfold, say no. <laughs> yes, I'd like to be dashing and weigh a lot less, but I don't have the clout to demand it. So I guess I'll just pray for a well-made toupee and scales that lie like a bandit. <laughs> There are two basic rules of dieting. Never watch television and never drive anywhere or be driven anywhere because you will eventually pass one of those little cafes on the side of which is written in large letters one of the most potent fatodisiacs known to man. Whenever I'm tense and the world starts to squeeze, I love to go for a drive. So I'll stop at the bank and go fill up the tank and proceed at 55 to the ocean. The mountains are just across town and no special time to be back. It's escape, it's a purge, and it helps kill the urge when I'm just on the verge of an eating attack. My thoughts take their shoes off and romp in the woods. They ascend to the sun in their mirth. But invariably, there is something I'll see that jerks me back to Earth, for it seems that a signboard will always appear on each highway and freeway and street with a one-word command, a one-word demand, a three-letter ordinance, eat. <laughs> in villages, cities, and hilltops, by shores, through deserts, the fields of wheat. Drive where I may, I can't get away from the one word I shouldn't see, eat. I'll be thinking of music, improving on Bach. I'll have the lost chord in my grasp. Then eat will appear, and all I can hear is my willpower's terminal gasp. <laughs> Wherever I wander, at home or abroad, they all have the same thing to say. Whatever the order I'm given, whatever the border I'm given, the order. Essen, mangiare, comer, manger. Once I was lost and alone in Tibet, crawling through snowbanks and sleet. And I came upon a yak with a poster on its back. Shangri-La, gas, lodging, eat. <laughs> The conquering armies of Rome had much of the world at their feet, but scrawled on the walls of the Britons and Gauls, they saw Caesar's a turkey and eat. <laughs> it can't be ignored. It's a snake in your bed. It's a cream puff that's stuffed with a goat. It's a thumb in the screw. It's a spike in the shoe. It catches the eye by the throat. For a moderate, logical, civilized person, there's only one way to fight back. If you hope to defeat the temptation to eat, Drive with your head in a sack. <laughs> We're going to take a break, have a bite to eat, and we'll be right back. Uh -huh. Little snack here. We're back. We're talking with Peter Schloss and Victor going on. We are a little short of time tonight because of our silly Tarzan skit, but I want to ask you one question before Betty comes out. What would happen, perish the thought, if you would ever end up weighing 160, 70 pounds? I would do the Michael Dunn story and be famous forever. <laughs> You're not going to really slender down, slip no, down, are you? No, no, I, I can't imagine a skinny Matterhorn. Just, <laughs> it wouldn't work, John. I want to bring Betty out here because uh, she is uh, she's such a fine actress, and uh, as you know, she was for years on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. She's currently starring in a four-hour NBC miniseries called The Best Place to Be, which will be on the air on both Monday and Tuesday night at the movies, September 7th and 8th. Would you welcome Miss Betty White? <laughs> fun to work with. Say funny things. Thank you. You not shrimp vine. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, was I love fun. working with you. Sketches. I remember a show you used to do when I was out here in California, because we've known each other a number of years. 
I call Life with Elizabeth with the late Del Moore that you did. Oh, that was such fun. That was and, a winging it about like this. Yeah, and you were super then. Oh, we right, had were such super a good then. time. Well, the audiences go along with you when you, they know that you haven't rehearsed and you've just... Yeah, this is not exactly a uh, four-star playhouse we do. We come you in you noticed that? I've noticed that. Afternoon, just take a shot at it and then go. <laughs> it's good to see you. How you feel? Fine. I'm feeling just great. Yeah, you're working a lot now? And... Yeah, I'm working, and I'm I'm uh, zooing it up a lot. We, uh... That's right. We had your friend, the uh, gentleman from the L.A. Zoo. Oh, Dr. Warren Thomas? Yes, Isn't he the, a uh, charmer? With the gorillas. He was here with the gorillas. He's he's sort of the father of all the gorillas in this country. He breeds gorillas. I mean, he, he helps them. To... Of course. He's a, he's a counselor, more or less. Counselor, yes. Well, yes. Gorilla pathologist. Everybody ought to have a hobby, the way Certainly. I look at it. I mean, but, uh, but we just broke ground last Wednesday for our koala house. We are going to have the, the only southern koalas in the whole world outside of Australia and only the second That is the only the country, world. is it not, in the world that has koala bears? That's right. Australia? Yes, that's the only place. They're and only native for that country. They're presenting us with six of them. And I'm so thrilled. I have to tell you something that, that was a big thrill today. They, they told me so many kind people have been sending in things for the koala right. uh, fund because in memory of Alan because right. they knew that he was a big zoo friend and he's such a flower plant man that they're going to name the whole plaza outside the new one the Alan Ludden Plaza and I, I was just nice. so glad to hear it. he would be happy with that too. Oh, he'd be so happy. we'll be right back We just have about a minute to thank everyone. So I wish you much success on the show on uh, September 7th and 8th. Thank you very much. And I've got a, a Carol Burnett special coming That's out right here. Us, and then a, a Love Boat 90 Minute special with Carol Channing. It's my week for Carol's. Hey. Full. Hey, thanks for being with us. It's always fun to have you here. Thank you. Even if I match Doc? Yeah, you and Doc uh, could go. Right out tonight, and no one would know the difference. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shrimp, bye. <laughs> I'm back to that, huh? Victor, Peter, thank you for being here. It's always a pleasure to have you, and good luck on your play. Thank you. Pete in New York. Thank you. Uh, tomorrow night uh, is Saturday. Saturday. We won't be here. <laughs> but Monday night, David Steinberg will be here with Bernadette Peters, Charles Grodin, and cartoonist Arnold Roth. Have a nice weekend. Good night. I'm humbled by that applause.